Okay, this video is looking at the tension between civilization versus savagery in The Lord of the Flies. Okay, um, and the first thing we need to do is actually ascertain what we mean by these terms. So, civilization is to do with this idea of human and cultural development, but particularly that is considered most advanced. So, we've gone beyond um, the sort of basic needs and survival and our civilization is about choosing to behave in a way that benefits more people than just yourself and obviously that's where a lot of the tensions come in this novel and as far as savagery goes it's got this idea of being fierce cruel and then particularly in literary context as you can see there the condition of being primitive or uncivilized so the savagery aspect was always very much be even before golding set up as the opposite opposition force to civilization and the significance of those two things being quite polarizing um, when you're writing about this i would avoid calling it civilization versus savagery um, i think it's just a bit clumsy fine for notes and things but not necessarily great in an essay so you could talk about the tension between the two or something like that it just sounds a bit more sophisticated and it is really important that you are really clear on what is meant by each of these words so it isn't the same as democracy versus fa or fascism and authoritarianism it's not the same as or as simple as jack versus ralph there's a lot of complexity in this um debate and a lot of it ha comes from the context in which this novel was written and the cultural history that was golden was bringing into this and it's almost a sort of nature versus nurture issue um a lot of British adventure stories had the sense that being British was implicitly better, um, particularly in justifying um, the empire and things like that. And therefore, when Golding is exploring the idea that there's this universal savage human instinct, which overrides almost anything else for the vast majority of the boys, he is sort of challenging this received wisdom to an extent that being British means that you are automatically unable to be savage which in the mid 50s was obviously a bit more of a complex issue perhaps than we might consider today so let's consider the context so this was published in 1954 the effects of the two world wars still being keenly felt two consecutive generations of young men had been sent to die horribly awfully and golding had watched this happen he had participated himself um and there's a lot of writing from the 50s which has this sense of humanity almost being doomed because the great war the first world war was supposed to be the end the war to end all wars and then it happened again you know less than 20 years later so this sense of trying to break the cycle and whether we could break the cycle or whether there is this sense of civilization being um on this downward spiral was present in a lot of stuff at the time you know there's a lot of dystopian fiction um that comes from the sort of late 40s early 50s and a lot of um fantasy and science fiction as well as these um more semi-realistic novels dealt with that issue um golding had served in the navy he'd seen the horrors of war firsthand and had seen the savagery that supposedly civilized people were able to do um to each other um we've got the most popular one obviously golding had been a school teacher people always like writing about that in essays so we could argue that he has seen the cruelty which children are capable of perpetrating against each other unfortunately that is true and you could argue therefore it is a natural innate in not necessarily natural but an innate instinct in people that we get taught out of as we grow up um and also the brutality that these children were being sent into it's really deliberate that he makes these mostly young public school boys which these um schools bred in the idea of duty to your country of patriotism of serving your country and most of them will have been growing up with the concept that they were automatically going to go into the forces and fight um and so when these boys are put on this island it's quite an interesting situation because theoretically these are the epitome of british civilization but because of the 
background and the context of the wars um, and the style of these schools, we end up with this um, system which is used as a method of upholding the civilised world, but had led to these horrifyingly brutal savage acts in times of warfare and through empire building as well. Um, we've got the realities of the Holocaust were still just being felt. I mean, we've grown up with this. And when you stop to think about it, it's horrifying to have been living through the time when this was discovered and to have seen what was happening must have been absolutely shaking um, because the horrifying savagery of the concentration camps and um, the Holocaust really did send shockwaves around the world because Germany had always been perceived as a civilised country, ideologically misguided. Um, and, you know, the idea of the Nazi party and stuff was seen as, you know, they'd got the wrong idea. But we've grown up in a world where we've known the true horrors of what they were perpetrating. But for the vast majority of the British population, that wasn't something we, they knew about until the war ended. And then it's this real shocking revelation that ordinary people, fathers, sons, brothers, had been complicit in the senseless slaughter of millions of innocent men, women and children. So not monsters, not people with a screw loose. There were plenty of those at the top, but the vast majority of the people who actually did the day to day running of these camps. Were probably what we consider to be normal people outside of this context and that is really scary when you stop to think about it and it kind of forces everyone to reflect on their own humanity and what we're all capable of so i think that that's one of the things that really golding's trying to get at is not that uh, not that cruelty and savagery are exceptions um but that actually they may quite easily become the norm if we're not careful and so this cautionary tale that the Lord of the Flies is, um, is often focused on that idea of at every step, we require everyone to step up and say no. And when you don't, you slide into a place where Piggy can be murdered and everyone kind of just gets on with it as if it's fun. None of these boys were evil when they got there, with possibly the exception of Roger. <laughs> um, but step by step, incrementally, that civilised behaviour was chipped away at. And I think that the realities of the Holocaust were something that forced everyone to start sort of confront this, that these weren't just three or four evil people in the Nazi party who were doing this. This was hundreds of thousands of ordinary people were helping with this terrible thing. OK. We've also got literary tradition um, and the empire to consider so um novels such as coral island are explicitly referenced in these things like treasure island robinson crusoe saw british boys and men shipwrecked on a savage island very much in inverted commas and they educated the natives in the ways of civilization i.e be more british and you will automatically be civilized okay and britain at that point liked to consider itself to be the epitome of civilization um which obviously when you start to dig into some of the things that actually happened were possibly a little less. Um, so there was a phrase at the time called going native, which could be hurled at um, Europeans, um, particularly white Europeans, British people, as if they're going backwards, because if they stop behaving like British people, like following the rules and customs of that society, then they're going native. And that was considered a bit of an insult almost as if you're becoming less evolved by leaving the ways of the British values behind. And what's interesting on this island is that it's only them there. So they don't have any, again, inverted commas, savages to show them the wrong path or to sort of influence them. They do it to themselves. So these are British boys who left to their own devices, sort of go native and become the savages which the British Empire had spent the previous hundred years trying to civilise. And so this argument of British exceptionalism and the idea of it being a civilising force, that being British made you better than other people and that you were almost helping places by bringing them civilisation, um, actually 
starts to fall apart in Golding's argument where he's looking at this and going, actually, being British doesn't mean anything to these boys. When push comes to shove and when it's safety and food and warmth and survival, all of us are capable of regression. And it's only because Britain was so wealthy that we were had the luxury of being able to consider other things and because we had that security and that safety. But when you don't have that and when you're living a more dangerous life, then you are going to have the look civilization almost becomes a luxury that you can't afford um, a bit like in bayonet charge where um it talks about you know um king honor etc all dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm so um to satisfy the maths department there's roughly an inverse relationship between civilization and savagery however you'll note i haven't started at or ended at zero for either of them it's not that there is no savagery the second they land on the island. We'll look at the start of the novel and how actually there are seeds of savagery right from the beginning. And it's not like there's no remnants of civilization left, particularly, obviously, the last few pages. And But I would say it goes like this and roughly does cross over in the middle. So chapters five and six, which are sort of the big, sh a couple of the big showdowns between um, Jack and Ralph, are where that real tension comes where there are those choices made and we're going to look at the the different choices that are made as we go through so firstly in the beginning so um all of the notes and stuff for the next couple of slides come from chapter one okay um so firstly you can see that they are in school uniform um i'm using mostly the photos from the 50s um film um because the American one is an abomination, which you should never watch because it gets most of the story wrong and misses the point. So um, the fair boy stopped and jerked his stockings with an automatic gesture that made the jungle seem for a moment like the home country's county. So right from the start, this is page one. You've got this idea of the boys are bringing Britain to the island. And so it starts very like Coral Island or something like that. This sense of, oh, they're going to come and they're going to set up a marvellous society and it's all going to go perfectly. So Golding is leaning into that literary tradition in order to subvert our expectations later on, in order to make his point about the state of the world. So it's very significant that these are schoolboys, that they're generally wearing uniforms, because um, that is a symbol of civilization. The British education system was often and still is often held up as the envy of the world but it also emphasizes their use but also has that sort of echo of soldiers uniforms the idea that these boys would have been moving from one uniform to another these are soldiers in waiting um <clears throat> so they begin to establish assemblies um seems to me we ought to have a chief to decide things as ralph says roger interestingly is the one who says let's have a vote um so they're trying to establish um a civilization based on the things they've seen so mostly school systems so assemblies democracy they use the conch to allow others to speak there's manners but there is also a sense of a person in charge um and then towards the end of the chapter you get a couple of quite interesting bits you get this when they first go and explore the island ralph jack and simon first go and explore the island at the end of chapter one they meet a piglet and this is a wonderful counterpart to chapter eight where they kill the sow okay so i always think with lord of the flies structure is one of the most useful things you can talk about and there's a lot of repeating patterns and motifs so look at the different hunts look at the different deaths look at the different fires because each one is used in a different way so here they come across a piglet, which is quite symbolic of their youth and inexperience as well. And Jack can't kill it. And he can't kill it because of the enormity of the knife descending and cutting into living flesh because of the unbearable blood. Now, when he kills a pig in chapter four, he smears the blood around on his face kind of unconsciously. By the time they're killing the sow in chapter eight, it's almost used as a ritual, like almost like a baptism where you get painted with the blood to signify your participation in the hunt. So the different ways they react to this quite savage instinct to kill, at this point, they're not hungry enough. They're not desperate enough. 
And so the civilizing instinct to not cause pain and not to kill overrides his interest. Because remember, Jack's interested in hunting right from the start. But he still here can't do it. But that humiliation and that failure actually drives a lot of his more savage instincts later on. However, Jack is not entirely civilized because one of the first things he says is an attack on Piggy. So you're talking too much, said Jack Merrick. You shut up, fatty. So right from the start, Jack is picking on someone weaker. He is defying authority and the systems when it suits him and when he thinks he can get away with it. So right from the beginning, Jack is not necessarily as civilised as he might appear. Um, it's also worth noting that they do elect Ralph a chief um, because there is this sense of the subservient deference to authority, though they struggle with that. But remember also that Ralph only ends up chief because he looks the part and has the conch. Um, and again, that initial decision, though actually a good one, because he does have those civilising instincts, is kind of accidental. We then get into the choir itself in chapter one, which I think is worth considering from the, persp the perspective of civilization and savagery. So the choir presented as rigid, disciplined um, people as a group. They are almost ruled again, originally by this authoritarian Jack. Remember, Simon faints and Jack's got no time for it. He's quite dismissive of other people's suffering. Um, he's got them still in their cloaks, in their uniforms, because that's what they should be in. Um, so his authoritarianism is on display right from the beginning. And these choirs are inextricably linked with public school life, which if we're then talking about the idea that this is the epitome of this British school system, which was held up as the epitome of civilization. Why does Golding then make Jack the ultimate symbol of savagery on the island or that savage regression? And it's a critique of the very established systems that created him. Jack is given power over the boys. He is allowed to exert his authority however he would like. Um, they, he's allowed to be brutal and cruel and get away with it because he has skills and because he's given that rank of authority. So right from the start, we're getting the idea that what these systems, which are apparently civilised, actually rely on quite savage instincts. Um, and also this helps to exemplify the hierarchies and systems these boys already experience. Most of these boys then obviously go on to be hunters. Simon is kind of the only one who explicitly goes the other way. Um, they're used to following orders. They're used to doing as they're told. They're used to Jack being in charge. So when Jack's instincts start to go wrong, the rest of them blindly obey. And again, that therefore we could argue is symbolic of the um, issues and the things that Golding saw in war. You only need one person in authority making bad choices before it then f starts to filter down and corrupt everyone else. Um, also worth noting how they're described so this is obviously a really popular one they're firstly described as a creature the creature was a party of boys marching approximately in steps they're marching the boy who controlled them so that's jack he controls them he shouts an order and they halted just like soldiers warily obedient the choir huddled into line so everything about this smacks of that sense of the military and again, reminds us that these boys in their civilised world are being trained to go out and commit violence and brutal acts in the name of civilization. Now, remember, Jack is never the hero of this novel. He's immediately set up as an antagonist to Ralph. Ralph is the one we like. Jack is immediately set up as the opposition. But Jack thinks he's the hero. And I think there's something quite interesting in that, that Golding was sort of commenting on the way that when we give people who have these savage brutal ideas the power and the authority they are able to see that they're able to justify themselves and jack always is able to justify his choice at least to himself and it never really occurs to him that he's in the wrong not really and I think that's quite key as well because Ralph does admit when he's made mistakes but savagery doesn't allow for mistakes to be made because it's survival of the fittest.
So when you're in a society where no one can make mistakes, then it's going to become brutal and very um, aggressive because there's no other way of dealing with things. So as we move on, still on the first day, we're in chapter two, you can see how there's already this tension developing. They're trying to establish a civilization. They put in systems, hands up. They're going to wait for the grown ups. They need shelters. They assign jobs. But they're young. They need some help. And as soon as they're left to their own devices, and again, I think that's where this nature versus nurture thing comes in. They're still young. They've been given some tools, but not enough. And then left to their own devices. Golding is saying without everyone else, without a bigger society, everything starts to crumble. Everyone has to play their part in keeping other people civilised. But on the other hand, we also have that they're establishing an army, hunters, as um, Jack calls them. We get the introduction of the beastie right from the start, chapter two. OK, so already there's something bad there. The lack of discipline about the fire leads to a death. OK, so again, the deaths on the island, you've got the Litlands at the start, you've got Simon's sort of two thirds of the way through, and then you've got piggies towards the end. Um, at this point, it's carelessness, but it's carelessness because no one is keeping an eye on the Litlands. Um, some people would argue that civilization is about looking after children. You know, the civilization grew out of the need to share childcare and education and things like that. But here, the neglect of the Litlands is already established. We have that sense of already everyone being out for themselves, really, and the lack of concern concern for people who are vulnerable coming through we also get the fact that children can only reflect the society they live in and the world they've been brought up in so what have these boys been taught so they've been taught turn taking and manners and things but they've also been taught that you need an army you need defense there's something big out there that's scary and i think that the civilization and savagery tension is really summed up by Ralph in chapter two, where he says we want to have fun and we want to be rescued. And they're kind of conflicting aims because being civilised isn't necessarily fun. It's about doing your part and playing your role and doing your jobs. And what they want is to have all of the um, their needs met without really having to try very hard to do so. And Jack is actually able to meet their needs a little better later on. He gives them safety and security, but that's through threats because they don't choose to play their parts. They are forced into it. Um, and that therefore is a society built on savagery, not a society built on civilization. Um, and it is really important to think about the idea that you can have a savage society. Savagery isn't necessarily just about individuals. It's about the idea that it's only about keeping people who are in charge in charge and using violence and fear and not looking after those who need looking after. So moving on to chapter four, um, <laughs> the title of this chapter, I think, is really key because it immediately gives us that those symbols of declining civilized standards. These boys will have been taught to wash their faces, keep their hair short, look presentable. And this chapter is telling us from the opening, from the title, they're losing these symbols. OK, um, and are giving in already. And it's only chapter four. OK, this is quite early. So we get the opening line. The first rhythm that they became used to was the slow swing from dawn to quick dusk. So they are immediately becoming beholden to nature. So they don't have bells and clocks and timetables and things that say it doesn't matter whether it's dark or light. It is seven o'clock. Therefore, it is time for breakfast like we do. They're immediately becoming beholden to nature rather than dominating it. So and oddly, a lot of people at the time this book was written would have seen that as a more savage way of living. They're not above nature they're being dominated by it they're giving into it in this sort of savage way and then we've got one of our big key quotations which lots of people use a lot of 
So um, this is obviously about Roger throwing the stones at the little ones. He says, here, invisible yet strong, was the taboo of old life. Round the squatting child was the protection of parents and school and policemen and the law. Roger's arm was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him and was in ruins. So really key ideas here. Um, Roger eventually becomes a murderer. The only proper murderer on the island. But at this point, it's only the memory of civilization that is holding him back. But they are memories. It, there aren't parents and school and policemen and law. And think about that. What he's worried about is punishment. When he realizes later he isn't going to be punished for hurting people, that's when he becomes truly dangerous. And he knows Jack is the place to satisfy that. So Roger is an interesting one because I think Roger sort of symbolizes those that very minority in society who do enjoy hurting other people. But when they're, and normally in a civilized world, they're not given any scope. They're not able to indulge in that and get away with it. But when you become more savage, when you stop protecting the vulnerable, but instead start ruling by fear and power, you then enable those people. And they're the people that normally we try as a civilized society to not have a place for because that is not the way to behave. So we're already getting here these little hints that the only thing keeping Roger back is memories, which he's going to realise doesn't work. And I think that idea of he was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him was in ruins. The idea that Golding is making a wider critique there and he's saying the world we're bringing these children up in is broken and doesn't care about these kids and doesn't care about teaching them right from wrong because we've become so myopic about the wars and the conflicts that people were fighting, that the damage was being done to the next generation almost without us realising it. So that's one of the few times where Golding, I think, is making a much bigger critique more explicitly about the world rather than inviting us to draw our own conclusions. So later in, cha in um, chapter four, and chapter four is quite a pivotal um, chapter, You've got Jack's mask, and the mask, I would say, is a real pivotal moment. It's this symbol of savagery, um, again, in inverted commas, for the people of the 50s when they were looking at the photos of explorers who were going out into, like, finding Amazonian tribes or, you know, a hidden African tribes and things like that. Almost always you see them painted. They have these ritualised outfits and face masks and... Um, things like that to and it's a very clear visual image tied to this idea of the 1950s of savage people so when Jack chooses to start getting putting on that mask that for the contemporaneous readers for Golding's readers in 1954 would have been an immediate link to those pictures of these sort of lost hidden tribes and these less civilized cultures that people were interested in at the time. And I think it's really interesting the way the mask is described. It talks about the idea of his body holding up a mask. So the mask is immediately established almost as its own separate thing. And it appalls them, but also fascinates them. He began to dance, which again is often kind of associated with that sort of savage tribal behaviour. Um, and his laughter became a bloodthirsty snarling. So he immediately becomes animalistic and dangerous. Um, and when I'm talking about this sort of savagery, tribal behaviour, I'm sort of talking from how the perspective would have been in the 50s. Um, you know, some of these cultures are quite brutal and dangerous, but many aren't. But for the average reader reading in the um, 1950s, that distinction wouldn't have been made okay and i think having that awareness of that is quite key he capered towards bill and the mask was a thing on its own so that idea of it becoming autonomous behind which jack hid liberated from shame and self-consciousness the mask compelled them so that's brilliant that that idea that jack can put on a mask and he stops being him he can do what he likes so that civilization that was holding back roger's arm 
doesn't affect Jack when he's wearing the mask. And I think that the connection between those two is a really key idea which you ought to be trying to look at. <clears throat> and the idea of the mask compelling them, they feel powerless. It has power over them right from the start. And that idea that he feels liberated is quite key. He's suddenly got this freedom. But where they're going, freedom to do what? But we already kind of know. So there's that discomfort of realising that Jack has found a, like a loophole almost. If he looks like a savage, he can behave like a savage. Just like when he looks like a choir boy, he has to behave like a schoolboy. But what you wear, how you present yourself to the rest of the world affects how you feel you can behave. And it's really key that Jack makes the choice to go for the savage, more increasingly ritualised killing later on in this scene. Because once he's got the mask on and he's liberated, he takes everyone, including Sam and Eric, who was supposed to be looking after the fire, to go and kill a pig. But it's that moment when a ship appears on the horizon and the fire is out and they can't signal them. So Golding has set up for us very clearly that there was a choice made. And Jack chooses the savage killing instead of focusing on rescue. And he ducks away from them. Look at that. Jack faced at once with too many awful implications, ducked away from them. And Piggy goes after him. You and your blood, Jack Marriage, you and your hunting, we might have gone home. And so got Piggy really clearly lays out for us that Jack made a choice. And his choice has implications for everyone else. Um, and it's worth noting that this killing isn't just about meat. The chant is the first thing we hear to get the idea that they're coming back. He talks about the lashings of blood that came from the kill. He's enjoyed it and that the ritual, the ritualised elements of this kill will be more developed later on as we actually, because we don't see this kill at the moment. The perspective in the book is still on the civilised side. As things continue to break down, Golden will shift that perspective and we will go on one of those hunts after Jack makes the final break with Ralph in chapter eight. But at the moment, what we see is the civilised boys hearing a chant coming through and hearing about the lashings of blood and they start claiming things. And he can't admit he was wrong. And that choice determines the path for all of them, because once he knows he's in the wrong, he has to keep going down that path, because in his world, being wrong is a sign of weakness. And weakness means he doesn't deserve to lead. And Jack absolutely believes he deserves to lead. And then we get this as well in chapter four. The two boys faced each other. And there was the brilliant world of hunting, tactics, fierce exhilaration, skill. And there was the world of longing and baffled common sense. So Golding positions Ralph and Jack as representatives of the opposing forces. But what's really important is that Jack's is more satisfying. Look at the description. Brilliant, fierce exhilaration, skill. And then there's the sense of being lost and confused and worried if you follow Ralph. Golding's showing us how appealing these little steps towards a more savage life are. They're more immediately satisfying to the sort of instincts and the physical needs that we have. Whereas Ralph's is hard work for uncertain return. And we've seen in history and to an extent we're seeing again the rise of populism in times of uncertainty where people who just say, look, come with me and we'll have a great time, has an appeal rather than saying, well, if you follow me, it's going to be hard for everyone, but probably long term, it'll be better overall. That's not a welcome message, but it allows people who don't really have a plan and don't have long term goals and don't have the best thought, the best hopes for all of society at their heart, just people for like me and mine. It allows them into power. And once they're in power, it's very hard to get it back off them. Um, Jack responds by punching Piggy when Piggy accuses him of this. He goes very violent. He attacks the weakest. And significantly, he breaks one of Piggy's lenses in his glasses at that point. So that symbolism there. If we talk about Piggy's glasses being this symbol of civilization and clear sightedness, that's now getting broken. 
and he apologizes but the apology doesn't do anything it doesn't make anything better it just makes it seem like oh well fair enough he's apologized but he still gets his way so it's paving the way for this inexorable decline because jack can do what he likes say sorry and there's no repercussions there's no punishment there's no come down for him and so later on we see that growing and again i think golding here is showing us how if you don't act if it if you let popular opinion get carried away, how hard it is to rein it back in later on. Okay. Um, and the chapter ends with a reenactment of the kill, which is this ritualized savage behavior. This wasn't a kill purely for food. It was to satisfy an urge, but also it brings the boys together. All of them who were involved feel part of a team now. They've had an experience someone else hasn't, but it's a violent act. And so these boys, are experiencing these rites of passage that are steeped in blood and violence, which will obviously shape the men they will become. But none of them are horrified by this. They're all excited by it. They all find it fun. I find the idea of these 12 year old boys celebrating m killing an animal and being bathed in its blood really quite horrifying. But that's because I have the luxury of living in a world where they don't have to do that. And so, again, Golding is looking at this and going, well, what are we teaching children? If we are glorifying war, we're teaching them that that's an aspirational thing rather than something that may be necessary, but is awful. And so we're perpetuating this cycle of violence and brutal, savage behaviour. So. We'll now look at this idea of Jack versus Ralph a little because this goes obviously through the whole novel. Um, but there's a couple of key moments. You have the assembly in chapter five and you have another assembly in chapter eight, which is before and after the search for the parachutist on the island. Um, and so these recurrent battles exemplify the wider struggle between civilization and savagery. Um, however, the longer that they are that um, they are left alone on the island, the more they slip into the savage side. So gradually we see the pendulum swing from Ralph being very definitely in charge in chapter one and two to starting to have to really fight in chapter four to chapter five having this row with um, Jack to chapter eight being rejected. OK, so the longer they're left alone, the harder it is to hold on to those civilised ideals. So again, Goldie may be saying that the longer we live in a world where we can't adhere to the ideals that we'd like to, the harder it will be to come back. So again, this section from chapter five is always really um, popular because people like being able to write bollocks to the rules in an essay, can't blame you. But I think it's really key to be able to unpick that. So in chapter, um, in the start, either chapter one or two, Jack's talking about how we'll have lots of rules and if anyone breaks them, he at that point, takes comfort in the rules because that is how his society has worked up to that point you have rules in school and anyone who breaks them gets beaten gets punished etc now he's realizing he doesn't have to play by anyone else's rules he can make his own what i think he here is ralph's comment because the rules are the only thing we've got that the laws the rules that we make and laws are only rules are the things that hold us all together and protect the weak and the vulnerable and the people who can't stand up for themselves. But Jack has no time for that. We're strong. We hunt. Well, who's strong? He's not talking about the little ones. He's not talking about Piggy. He's not talking about Simon. He's talking about people like him. So because of his lack of empathy and his lack of concern for everyone else, he can encourage this more civ um, savage behaviour. And look at what he's promising. He's promising to go after the beast and it's violent. He's not saying we'll just kill it or we'll beat and beat and beat. He's relishing in that violent act, that sense of being physically stronger than others. But at that point, he gets brought back in to an extent. But then this comes back up again in chapter eight, where he goes, who thinks Ralph oughtn't to be chief? So he makes a direct attack on Ralph's authority and it doesn't work the silence continued breathless and heavy and full of shame slowly the red drained from jack's cheeks and then came back with a painful rush the hands that held the conch shook he cleared his throat and spoke loudly all right then he laid the conch with great care in the grass at his feet 
The humiliating tears were running from the corner of each eye. I'm not going to play any longer. Not with you. And he leaves. So at this point, you might say this is a victory for civilization. The boys don't choose savagery. They choose Ralph and what he represents. And I think, honestly, I find that one of the most heartbreaking lines of the play where he said, of the novel where he says, I'm not going to play any longer. Because it reminds us, Golding constantly throws in these little things that remind us that these are children. And even though Jack becomes this really fierce and terrifying character, he's a kid. And he's using words like, I don't want to play anymore. Which I find really sad, but also really powerful because this idea that even at this age, he can have this brutality because he's let it free. And that idea that he lays the conch down, he still has respect for it at this point, which obviously in a couple of chapters he won't. But that humiliation and that frustration. But what's also key is that Jack's exit isn't a victory for civilization. Within four pages of this exchange, many of the bigger boys have already gone to Jack. So it suggests that they know they're making the bad choice because they know they ought to stick with Ralph because that's the sensible option and the better civilized option. But they go anyway. They choose the savagery because it's more fun, it's more exciting, it's more immediately satisfying. And I think you could argue this a chapter eight is called Gift for the Darkness. Is this the real gift for the darkness? We see later, obviously, we've got the pig's head on the stick and that being left as a gift for the beast. But I think, particularly for those of you who want to get into the symbolism, what the darkness, what the beast really benefits from is so many of the boys giving in to their savage instincts. That's where, they're, where the victory comes. If Jack had left and no one had gone with him, that would have been the end of it. But they're leaving Ralph and coming to Jack, tells Jack that he's right, that he's on the right path, that he ought to continue as he is. So once again, he never has to question himself or whether what he's doing is right. He never has to face up to the horrible things he's doing because other people give him that reinforcement. So then we'll move on to obviously the big um, savage image of the novel and quite often on the front of the books and things um this head is um for the beast it's a gift jack says in chapter eight they leave a ritual sacrifice so all of these behaviors again are the sorts of things which people in the 50s reading about um these you know remote uncivilized in inverted commas tribes would have heard about these sacrifices and these rituals and have associated that with them um and we this is the chapter in chapter eight where we follow this hunt and we're suddenly with the savage boys as opposed to in chapter four where we're with ralph and the civilized boys and we see this hunting becomes ritualized and savage that pig suffers before it dies okay they in, they do more than just kill it for food it's about dominance, it's about inflicting pain. We get the chant coming back, we get the reenactment. And the reenactment is particularly key because it's increasingly blurring the line between people and prey. Which obviously, then in chapter 12, when they're hunting Ralph, that distinction has kind of almost entirely gone. And hunting becomes part of the game, uh, hunting, hurting others even, becomes part of the game, so long as it's not you. So whoever ends up in the middle of the circle is going to get hurt. And that's part of the fun. So it's also normalising violence and hurting others and not having that um, sense of looking after each other. And then we get this sense of the ritualised sacrifice, this gift for the beast. It turns the pig's head almost into an idol that speaks for the beast um, to Simon. Um, and again, is that sort of very savage tribal imagery that would have been popular at the time. And I think what's really significant and we have to remember is that this is Jack and the choir, who at the beginning are the epitome of British school boys and civilization, and they have become the most savage. Um, and the fact that it doesn't happen all at once. If, if on day one, Jack had tried to get the boys to do this, they'd have been like, nah. This is mad. But because it's happened step by step by step by step, it suddenly just becomes part of their lives. So Golding, again, is warning us about that, about the idea that there has to be this 
awareness of what could happen. If we've gone through these two major wars, we have to learn lessons and do something to stop it happening again and again. OK, and I think particularly as, you know, someone who'd served in the war and had seen these schoolboys that he'd been teaching go through this, there must have been this sense of, God, they're going to go again. Because what I remember, the 50s and 60s was dominated by the Cold War. Um, and America and Russia, we had um, Korea, um, Vietnam started in the late 60s. So this sense of a, a third world war, the next generation having to go again, didn't seem that absurd. OK, also notable that in this chapter, Jack finally becomes chief and note the capital C at this point. It becomes his identity, the identity associated with the mask is the chief. Um, and the boys are described now as either savages or the tribe. So this transformation becomes codified in the language that Golding is using. It's very clear to us that these boys have chosen this savage path because that is actually literally the word that is used for them at this point. And then obviously that leads inexorably to Simon's death. Um, now, you'll have covered this a lot in lessons, so I'm not going to do too much on Simon's death itself. But the boys become the beast. Their increasing savagery leads them to become the thing they fear. And also worth noting, this is a horrible, painful death that Simon encounters. He's ripped to pieces. This is awful. But it's also at the height of their ritualised, chaotically savage behaviour. It's in the middle of the dance, the chant, the reenactment of the hunt. And it almost seems like the logical conclusion to what we've seen a couple of times before. It just escalates and escalates and escalates to this horrifying moment. What I think is really interesting is the next morning between Piggy and Ralph. Where Ralph declares that it was murder. And I'm sure you've discussed in lesson whether or not it is murder or not. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that he's prepared to face those realities and the moral conundrum what he's done. And Piggy isn't. Piggy absolutely refuses to believe um, in this at all. And he's just like, we were scared. And then you get this final line from Ralph. I wasn't scared, said Ralph slowly. I was. I don't know what I was. So the fact that even Ralph and Piggy participate in this is really key because Golding is saying, again, remember what I said, it's not one or the other. Savagery is found in all of us. Civilised behaviour is the constant suppression of that savage instinct as far as Golding is concerned. And the only one who doesn't display any savagery at any point is Simon because he's the victim. So those people who haven't got any of that in them in this world that Golding's writing about are victimised, are put in danger because savagery will always start to rear its head at some point. And I think it's really interesting that Piggy denies this. So even civilised people will deny the truth of their own involvement. He's quite happy to go after others. Piggy's quite happy to call Jack out when he makes a mistake or does something dreadful. But when it comes to looking at his own behaviour, Piggy can't do it. And obviously Piggy represents logic and reasoning and he's using his logic and reasoning to excuse himself rather than take responsibility. He's given that opportunity and he refuses to do it. And I think a lot of us would find ourselves in that situation. But Ralph is prepared to take responsibility and he isn't prepared to take the easy excuse that Piggy does of saying he's scared. Ralph says, I wasn't scared. It was something else. And that's probably the closest to the truth of any of them. Um, and he's prepared to challenge himself and ask the hard questions. And I think Golding there is asking us, are we prepared to do that too? Are we prepared to look at our behaviour? We talk about this a lot with like anti-bullying and stuff. And, you know, are you prepared to just stand by and let someone else get hurt? Well, if so, what does that say about you? And that's the bit none of us ever really like having to deal with. Um, so now I just want to talk about this sort of overarching idea of being frightened of people really quickly. So Piggy in chapter five has this really important quotation, unless we get frightened of people. So Jack is able to rise in power because he offers protection from the beast um, and the need for safety beats logical thinking. So people are quite happy to endorse his more savage behaviour because it gives them some security. So again, we've got that tension developing. 
but both Piggy and Simon, who says maybe it's only us in chapter five, can see the problems with this, but the others can't, and so follow the more savage path. But this lack of awareness for everyone, because if people don't realise what leads to savagery, the people who are seeking power can exploit that. So Jack can continue to push boundaries as he can threaten to remove his protection if they disagree, which is what we see later on. And this comes to its peak in Simon's death. The dance is a savage response to fear and the remaining and kills the remaining symbol of goodness on the island of purity. Jack, um, Ralph and Piggy still have that, but not untainted. But the calculated savagery of Piggy's death, where Roger decides to kill him, eliminates the two people who spoke out explicitly about the true nature of the beast. And if we see the beast as people's innate evil and savagery, then it's almost like anyone who sees the truth is a threat to that, because as soon as people understand it, then they can fight back. And what Golden's trying to do this whole book is tell all of us about the savagery inside us so that we can fight back. If we don't know it's there, if we don't know what's waiting, we can't challenge it. Which then brings us to Piggy's death, which is violent, cruel and senseless. Um, and it's given much less ceremony than Simon's. It feels almost expected. We will have to feel the brutality. And obviously it's inextricably linked to the destru destruction of the conch. At that point, it feels irretrievable to go back. What I think is often overlooked, though, is this bit that happens straight after, where Jack tries to murder Ralph. Where viciously, with full intention, he hurled his spear at Ralph. He tries to kill him with full intention. He intended to murder him. So Jack only isn't a murderer because he, the spear didn't land. But I think there's something really interesting there. And it's that symbolism of their ongoing conflict because civilization, Ralph survives. He might be battered and brutalized, but he survives. So that sense that savagery can't, you can't, once you've been civilized, once you have learned those systems, Golding saying you can't el eliminate them completely, but you can do terrible damage to them and it needs people to fight to bring it back. And then you get this the way this chapter ends which has some real menace in it roger edged past the chief only just avoiding pushing him with his shoulder the yelling ceased and sam and eric lay looking up in quiet terror roger advanced upon them as one wielding a nameless authority and i think that's really interesting because roger has something jack hasn't got now roger has, is a murderer and that gives him this nameless authority and that idea that he only just avoids pushing the chief with his shoulder. He's beginning to challenge, to threaten Jack, because actually he is now more brutal and more savage and prepared to go further than Jack and has gone further than Jack. And so the danger implied by Roger there is really chilling. And that sense of fear and intimidation, now the standard, and it's really key, is that it cuts away here. So we don't know what happens next. Golding leaves it to our imagination because we know the brutality and savagery that is going on. And then we get to the end. OK, I'm going to skip over Ralph's um, hunt. At first glance, it may appear that the ending is hopeful for the return of civilization. They get rescued. Yay. However, I think it's always worth noting. It's the savage act of burning the forest that alerts the naval ship. It's the hunt. And burning down the forest and that short sightedness and that willingness to hurt themselves in their pursuit of their goal of attacking Ralph is what actually ends up with them getting rescued. So there's a real ambiguity there about the message that's coming through at the end. Um, but also worth noting that Ralph is proved right. The smoke is the key to rescue. So his message from the start is what gets them rescued. But it's the horribly savage hunt of him that reduces him to almost an animal that ends up in the eventual success so golding's really leaving that really ambiguous um we get ralph reasserting his chieftainship at the end um when the naval officer arrives he says i'm in charge jack is suddenly described as a little boy who's got these extraordinary trophies of like his choir cap and the broken spectacles and things and it suddenly really diminishes Jack 
because when a bigger, more intimidating force comes in, he suddenly has no power. So Golding there is saying that these brutal, savage behaviours only have as much power as they're sort of allowed to have to a certain extent. It requires people to stand up or for something bigger to come in. Um, and then we get the naval officer. He says, I should have thought that a pack of British boys, you're British, aren't you? Would have been able to put up a better show than that. And just the lack of understanding and I think that's such a nasty thing to say to them. It just seems really harsh. But it's also bringing it back that notion of British exceptionalism. Where he's going, well, if you're British, you shouldn't behave like this. Whereas Golding's conviction in this novel appears to be that this evil and savagery lurks within everyone. And civilization is almost a defense against it. And when it crumbles, we revert. So Golding's there going, it's got nothing to do with being British. It's got to do with being safe and secure and looked after and having a wider civilization society to live in. And when that's taken away, everyone has that capacity to revert back to this very base, instinctual, savage behaviour. And then we get that final um, focus on Ralph. In the middle of them with filthy body, matted hair and unwiped nose. And again, compare that to his description right at the start of the novel. Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart and the fall through the air of the true wise friend called Piggy. And I think what's really key here for the purposes of this conversation is that Ralph is still capable of feeling, despite basically becoming an animal for much of that chapter where he's snarling and racing and can barely breathe. He's not become completely savage. He still has those civilised feelings and concerns and sense of loss. So if you can retain that sense of self and caring for others, then savagery can be held at bay. And the fact that the focus of the novel returns to Ralph at the end does suggest that hopefulness that he's the one who will be able to take this away and hopefully bring something positive. So some final thoughts. Um, never talk about civilization and savagery as an either or. It's always on a scale to one extent or another. OK, it's never just and it's rarely an obvious choice and both can exist in the same person. OK, for much of the book, and that's kind of the point Golding's making, barring, say, Roger and Simon, who are obviously the exceptions. The vast majority of these boys don't behave, behave as a, a complex mashup of the two. And it's where the in, what influences them at any one time that determines their behaviour going forwards. And therefore, the vast majority of people are in that middle was included. Um, Golding had seen a world ruined by a growing savagery and what he's trying to do here is aiming to encourage people to choose civilised behaviour because it is a choice. If we don't choose that one the savagery comes in almost unnoticed according to Golding. So very few of these boys choose brutality and savagery what they choose is not to be, do the hard work of being civilised. So they fall down the easy option um, and it just incrementally chips away at them. Um, and because they get resort to their more basic needs, they forget the bigger picture. And Golding's also making the point that civilised behaviour can seem to be a luxury, but it is necessary for the survival of everyone savagery is fundamentally selfish so when jack's saying we're strong we hunt he's just talking about him and people like him the vulnerable the weak the disenfranchised they're the people who are getting left behind at that point and so fundamentally golding is presenting this novel as a cautionary tale about incremental decline into savagery not something that happens overnight but something that step by step is allowed to happen because ordinary people don't stand up and fight against it and that is the call to arms that he's creating when he's exploring the complexities of the idea of civilization and savagery in Lord of the Flies.